we're thrilled to welcome presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. And Vivek, we have some great partners with us. We have people from First Liberty who you've met, from Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life that you met, the Heritage Foundation, Foundation, as well as the Family Policy Alliance. We're thrilled to have you here. As we talked about, we believe we're better together. We're better when we're, we're unified. The first time I met you was in these offices. And I remember driving in, I called my peer in Ohio, and I said, do you know who this guy is? And I murdered your name. I, I <laughs> had okay. no idea what, and he said, oh, you mean Vivek? Yeah. And I said, sure. I said, well, he wants to come in to meet with me, and we just had a great meeting. And I remember calling my boys, who aren't much younger than you, mm -hmm. and I called my boys and said, there's very few people that you meet that you would say they're very rare. And I said, I just met a guy who's very rare. And I didn't know you wanted to run for president at that time or if God was knocking on your heart. Mm -hmm. This is a unique path. You're a young guy. You're 37. Um, you've been in business. You have not been in politics. You don't have a law degree. What is it about your journey that you believe, if we're talking about biblical terms, you're Esther. Mm. For such a time as this, I need to do this. Yeah. What's your call to run for president? So you're right, I am 37. I'm the first millennial ever running for US president as a Republican. And when I sat down with Apoorva last December, when we first felt called to do this, when I said God was knocking on our heart, that's exactly how, how it felt. Her first question for me, and you've met, you've met Apoorva a couple of times now. She, you married up. I did, I did, I did. And I, I, that, that, we like to say truth, that's, that, that's true. And so, you know, I think she had, a, she had a challenging question for me, which was for us, which is to say that even if this is what we're called to do, are we not sure that you will be better at this 20 years from now with more wisdom and experience between now and then? And that one made me pause for a while that's hard to argue with. It's almost certainly, oh, sure. I would hope, true that each of us will gain and learn more from the experiences that allow us to lead even more effectively in the future. But we came back to being called to do this now because I actually think that right now I'm not yet, in, in a true way, I'm not yet jaded and cynical, tired or defeated. I am genuinely hopeful for the future of our country. And as the young one in this race, I'd be the youngest president ever elected if elected. I think I'm not actually the only young one. I think our nation itself is actually a little young. Mm. Not a nation in decline, as it seems like most Americans have just accepted, take it for granted. The pie is shrinking, the nation's in decline, now we just fight over how we split it up. I don't think we have to be a nation in decline. I genuinely believe it, like not in some politician -y kind of way, just in a true way in my heart, I feel that we are actually a nation in our ascent, going through our own version of youth, of adolescence, figuring out who we're going to be when we grow up. And that speaks to me because adolescence wasn't that long ago for me. <laughs> you know? and, and, and we all lose our yeah. sense of who we are when we're going through adolescence. Yeah. We, maybe it's true for all of us or most of us. It certainly was true for me. We lose our self-confidence. We lose our sense of who we are, why we're here, what we're meant to be. But we're stronger on the other side of it when we get to adulthood. And so in some ways, Bob, it feels like it takes a young person blessed with the inexperience of politics to perhaps even see our politics that way. That's actually how mm -hmm. I see it, is that, you know, and I think what, what called me into this is relative to the other people in the race. And I'm going to be, I'll be very honest today. I'll, my goal is the campaign today included is to be as unfiltered as I can be, was really tempted to sort of squint and get excited about someone else that will lead us to where we need to be, our promised land as a nation. And what I found was a lot of good people who had different insights on the different problems that we face. But it feels like as a movement, I'm talking about the conservative movement now, we have gotten in the habit of running from things. We're running from something. I think we need to start running to something, mm. right? Our vision of what it means to be an American. I mean, you try it with your son's peers, try it 
I try it with my peers, people my age, younger than me. Ask them, today's Flag Day, actually. I don't know if people are mostly aware of that. It's the day we celebrate the U.S. flag mm -hmm. and what it represents. It's not the cloth we celebrate. It's what it represents. Ask them what it means to be an American. What does it mean to be an American in the year 2023? You get a blank stare in response. And I think that blank stare, that vacuum, is the black hole at the heart of our national soul right now. And we can point all we want to the poison. I think what each of us needs to do is look in the mirror and ask ourselves and look in the hole that resides perhaps even within each of us. And for me, I think that I'm not sure I would see things that way if I had worked in Washington, D.C. in the halls of Congress or the Senate or a government building and trying to bridge some of these seemingly unbridgeable divides for the last 20 years. Maybe I would be jaded, cynical, tired, and defeated, but that's not me today. You know, I kind of remember my adolescence. Okay, so it was a little bit <laughs> a longer ago. But I think you're right. People are motivated to run against something for only so long. But they want to be motivated to run for something, towards something. So I've been very open. I said, I think this is a Bob Seger moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's time to turn the page. Yes. And that's what you're saying, turn the page. So if we turn the page to, say, of Vivek Ramaswamy, or turn the page to whatever America elects, what should America be looking for in their next president? What are the leadership qualities they should be looking for in their next president? So I think, I mean, there's a lot of things on that list, but let me start with where we are today, because I think that those qualities, some of them are timeless, some of them are specific to the moments we're in. I think I'll give you some that are specific to the moment we're in. I think we need someone who's not just able to talk to and reach the hearts and minds of, frankly, those of us who are in this room. We're in this room for a reason. It's everyone else out there that we actually need to reach. So one of the commitments I've made in this campaign is that literally, without exception, we will talk to anyone. We will go to college campuses, including when other Republican candidates don't go. Three weeks ago, Kathy and I visited the south side of Chicago, not where a lot of for even Democratic politicians, for that matter. Not many though. caucus voters. Not are many there. caucus voters. <laughs> and, and, and we spend a lot of, we love our time in Iowa, but the point is we're not running to lead sure. a political party. We're running to lead a nation. I, I, I don't know if you all have seen my interviews with you know, Chuck Todd to Don Lemon to Dana Bash this last weekend. If you're not willing to sit across the table from NBC News, I think you're not ready to sit across the table from Xi Jinping. And I think that that's something we need to embrace. And there's, there's two things, there's two sides to that. One is to practice what we preach. It is easy for me to come into this room and talk about free speech. It is hard for me to go to a room full of predominantly poor black people in the south side of Chicago, answer questions about racial reparations, and then talk about the virtues of free speech. But we still mean what we actually say. So in a certain way, we have to you know, practice what we preach. But then the job is, you know, put that in reverse, What's another quality that's important in the next president is we need someone who's actually willing to preach what we practice. And the way that we live our lives, Bob, I think we've visited each other's homes at this point. You came to Columbus. I've visited you and Darla here. Thank you for welcoming us to your home here. We know the values that we live by and our families live by. Maybe we need to actually preach what we practice. The fact that the ultimate privilege, we hear that word bandied around a lot today. I'll admit it. I had privilege. I wasn't raised into money. My parents came to this country with almost no money. I've lived the American dream. This country has given us so much. I've lived the American dream founding multi-billion dollar companies and developing medicines that save lives today. But I was only able to do that from a stable foundation. My, my dad often said, you jump higher if you're jumping off of a fixed for a floor rather than one that's shaking. Two parents in the house with a focus on education, and yes, with a focus and humility before God. And we raise our two children the same way. And so I want to see our movement, the campaign slogan here, I mean, we, were, we were talking about this before in, in smaller group, it's one word, truth, is the slogan of our campaign. And what do we want out of a leader? We want something, we want the quality out of a leader that matters most is a leader who is willing to speak the truth. When I talk about truth on the campaign trail, what is true? God is real. There are two genders. Fossil fuels 
are required for human prosperity. Unborn life is life. Reverse racism is racism. Nations do have borders. Families and parents determine the education of their children. The nuclear family is the best known form of governance to mankind. Capitalism is the best system known to lift people up from poverty. Three branches of government in this country, not four. The U.S. Constitution, the thing that brought us together in 1789, is the best guarantor of freedoms in human history. These things are true, and we should not apologize for them. We mm. should not stand down for the truth. We will stand up for the truth. We will fight for the truth, but it's not that we're fighting for ourselves or for my vengeance or for my grievance. Mm. It's that I'm fighting for the truth. And whoever it is, and I love the way, you know, choose well, 2024, it's beautifully said. Whoever it is, it's almost, let's not even obsess right now over this, that's next year. Yep. Whoever it is, we have to define the what and the why. What do we stand for? Why do we stand for it? And whoever we choose, let it be a person who is unafraid to stand up for the truth. It's a big part of what this country is found in. Thank you. As we talked about in the smaller group, you know, I think people so much want hope. And they so, they so long for the truth, what yes. is true, okay? Um, we're a Christian ministry. Uh, you're a person of the, of the Hindu faith. Religious liberty is exceptionally important to us. Yes. The appointment of justices is extremely important to us. First Liberty is a partner of ours. As president, who would you go to to find out who should be appointed in this very crucial branch, the judicial branch? Mm -hmm. That's a big part of the president's job. Who would you go to, say, for resources? Or what would form your opinion about what justices get on that bench? Frankly, it's a lot of the same people here. I, 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 there's some areas where I do think we need to reinvent the wheel. This is one of the areas where I think we can just actually follow what's actually been time-tested and true. I think the group of people who advised President Trump did an outstanding job in putting jurists on the Supreme Court and in federal courts across this country. And this actually made the first place where I say this, Bob, but we actually are already underway, and our goal is by the end of this summer to release the list of target nominees for the federal courts, just so people can see that transparently. We shouldn't hide that ball, so our goal is to have that out by the end of August, which is our list of, it will either be these individuals or individuals who embody these attributes and one thing we're going to do a little bit differently this time is also, not in any ad hominem sense, but just in a transparent sense, here would be a list of jurists that embody judicial philosophies that, as a U.S. president, I disagree with and would not be the kinds of jurists that we would appoint into those seats. So who do we go to? I think it's going to be a lot of the same folks, even some of the folks who are in this room and the organizations they represent. You know, the Federalist Society does great work, but I don't believe in just relying on one institution, but a, but a diverse array of the groups the same groups that advise President Trump there, I think that's one of the great accomplishments of the Trump administration. I don't need to reinvent that wheel. That's exactly the philosophy we're going to use to and, nominate and, our judges. And one of those groups is in that room, is, or in this room, this First Liberty. Yes. But one of the things that I said, or say to a lot of people when they ask about your candidacy, and I say, listen, he doesn't look like us. He doesn't believe like us. But I believe he can defend religious liberty more vigorous than us. How do you believe you can defend religious liberty from the platform you've been given uh, with the stage that you're on? First is it starts with conviction. So my conviction is that this nation was founded on religious liberty because, as John Adams said it, our Constitution was made for a moral people. So though I said that, I, and I said it is true, the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, is the strongest guarantor of freedoms in human history in any nation. Even that document only works against the backdrop of a people who actually find the higher truth through faith itself. And so protecting that, as opposed to now seeing the state that we have created, we the people have come together to create a government made for a moral people, what a perversion of the state it would be, and it is now, to now be weaponized against the higher call to truth, which is actually faith in God. So it starts from a place of conviction. <clears throat> But in addition to conviction, there are some conveniences, and I enjoy some of those conveniences, which is that you're right. My, 
last name is harder to pronounce than most. Although, you know, you give me a run for your money. You know? <laughs> but, but, but that's okay. We share some, yeah. something common there, too. Just real quick, I tell yeah. all presidential candidates, you know, the initials of my last name are VP. I like that. <laughs> so I like that. I'd be on your short list. Uh, no, go ahead. I like that. I like that. Well, I, 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 I thought you were angling for the judge point. No, no, I'm just kidding about that. The, uh, and, and by the way, I did go to law school. I just I didn't practice law. So we'll try to put that to use in some of the judge selections, too. But I'll, joking aside, I, uh, I think I'm in a unique position, and it comes with a unique responsibility, which is to say that I'm, I'm not Christian. I was not raised in a Christian household. We believe in honesty and transparency, and I will never pretend to be something that I'm not. But we do share the same Christian values that this nation was founded on. And I understand it. I, I, I appreciate it. Like, I genuinely appreciate it when I'll get a question. It actually happens more often than not in Iowa. It shows that we've built trust in a room of this size in different parts of the state. Or someone will stand up, usually towards the end, it doesn't happen in the first half, but towards the end and say, you know, can you talk about your faith and are you going to be able to lead, do you believe we're a Judeo-Christian nation or founded on Judeo-Christian principles? Talk to me about that. First of all, I think that that's what we need more of is open conversation. And I actually get it that for certain people it can be tough, not impossible, but tough to say, wait, we're a nation founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And then here's this Hindu guy coming along saying that he wants to lead our nation. How's that going to work? The, the things I would say is the Judeo-Christian values are exactly the values that I was raised into and exactly the values into which we raise our children. And if it's the choice between having somebody who's a self-professed you know, Christian versus somebody who embodies those values, Certainly, we're on the side of embodying those values, and I'm still married to my first wife. We're going to keep it that way, and our children, our children grow up in the same household, yeah. and, and we're proud of that. But the, 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 part, the, part I, the part that I want you guys to hold my feet to the fire on is that nobody is going to accuse me of being a Christian nationalist along the way, <laughs> and so I'm not going to be shy about it. We're holding the hard line, and actually, we're not even going to be shy about it. We're going to be pretty uninhibited about standing the line for religious liberty. And even the first time we met in this building, you know, you showed me the, if, I hope you don't mind me talking about this, but the, with the, the impressive vision. plans and the yeah. visions for yeah. this institution, yeah. right? What you're building, you actually, I think I invited you to come, I don't know if you remember this, I invited you to come to uh, a speech I was given at the Land Expo and you couldn't make it because right. you were, speaking of land, focusing on land expansion and zoning. Wanted to get rezoned. Yes. Rezoned, right? And you told me a story, and maybe people in this room are familiar with it, but it stuck with me about a Democrat, someone on the other side, who still said that this zoning body shouldn't be weaponized. Right. But it was, was it three to two, am I right? It is three to two. It was two. three to two, right? So it was one guy on the other side that made the difference as to whether or not you could be zoned in a way that allowed you to pursue your vision for this institution. That's the way the threats to religious liberty present themselves today. It's not just through the front door through the back door as to who's going to loan you the money, whether or not you show up on the SPLC, Southern Poverty Law Center, or as I call it, selling political lies to corporations list <laughs> for what counts as a hate group, right? And the, the battle against ESG that folks like Andy yep. and I have been waging for the last couple of years in this country, it's a way of raising the cost of credit in part whether or not you align with the secular versus religious values mm -hmm. of an orthodoxy in America. And so part of this comes from conviction, part of it comes from the convenience of, mm. of, of being unshackled uh, from, from the name calling and labeling, but part of it comes from also an understanding of the ways in which the threats to liberty, religious liberty present themselves today. It's in the micro, not just the macro, but Amen. it's actually even more dangerous when it presents itself yeah. that way. Really well said. You know, when we talked about justices earlier, and one of the things we give the Trump administration, and you just said too, a lot of credit for, yep. is the justices he appointed. Three of those justices were part of overturning Roe v. Wade. Yes. And they threw it back to the states, the elected representatives. And a great answer to prayer, 50-year prayer mm -hmm. for that to happen. What do you believe the federal government's role? If you're president of the United States, what's the federal government's role in advancing the sanctity of human life? Obviously, we partner with SBA Pro-Life. This is a cornerstone issue of ours. 
What is the role of the next president as it comes to advancing a culture of life in this country? Well, the first thing I want to say is I think it took the courage of conviction for those justices. It was the stare decisis came up a lot, uh, let the law stand. And you know, I often find when we resort to Latin phrases in the law, it means we're actually squeamish about yeah. <laughs> saying what we actually mean. Just say it in English, let the law stand. No, I will not let that law stand because it was never actually the correct interpretation of the Constitution or the law itself, which shows how important those judgeships are. So that brings me to the first and most important answer is continue to appoint federal judges who actually share a deep conviction in what the Constitution says, rather than inventing things that the Constitution does not say, such as a substantive due process right. Number one responsibility. And that's constitutionally codified most important. Second is actually next most important, but actually is underappreciated, I think, is to set a cultural tone of standing for life, all forms of life, all life, including unborn life. And what I mean by that is I think we can talk about this issue in ways. I think, if I may say so, Bob, I've had, I'm proud of the success I think I've had in this country of probably bringing more people along with us amongst people who never you would have thought would have come along with us by just talking about the issue a little differently. So speaking of Dobbs, Clarence Thomas did this well. What did he say? He brought the case of a woman, pregnant woman walking down the street. She's assaulted. The unborn child dies as a consequence. I'll challenge you to find one person in this country who says that that criminal does not deserve to be held liable for the death of that unborn life. Hard pressed, call yourself DR, Democrat, Republican, pro-choice, pro-life. You're not gonna, you would be hard pressed to find somebody to say that person doesn't deserve criminal liability. What does that say? Most of us share pro-life instincts because it is grounded in the truth. And so then now once we've established that, now we just need to cut through the veneer that we've created, women's rights versus men's rights. Well, now let's have an open conversation about walking the walk when it comes to being pro-life. Let's have a conversation about adoption, about emergency pregnancy centers and the role of education and the role of support. I, for one, am open to a conversation even about the role of pulling in child care, pro-family policies that help people voluntarily also have already gotten to yes. Countries like Hungary have taught us a lot that we can learn from. And actually, the rate of elective abortions has just plummeted to near, you know, close, darn close to, you know, as sloped down to zero as you're going to get in that country. And then I think you want to talk about women's rights versus men's rights, because that's the hang up for most people. I am in favor of state laws here, but state laws nonetheless, that attach greater sexual responsibility to men in cases of you have technology that helps us confirmed paternity tests on a genetic basis. This shouldn't be about men versus women. It's not a women's rights issue. It is a human rights issue. And what I find, Bob, is that it completely changes the tenor of the discussion when we authentically are actually willing to talk about not only what are we against, but what are we for. Mm. These are the things that we can be for. So between federal judge appointments, between actually setting that national tone, and then the easy stuff. I say the easy stuff, but it's important. The federal government, our taxpayer dollars, are literally funding abortions by the many, many thousands per state from the federal government. Federal funding going to Planned Parenthood. This is unconscionable. It's a betrayal of trust in our conviction as citizens in the federal mm -hmm. government that we fund with our taxpayer dollars. That too is something that we should be able to cut. That's, that's, those are the, some of the easiest answers and I think answers that you'll hopefully hold me to when I'm in that office. So we will definitely have the family leader, SBA Pro-Life. We will want to have a champion in the White House who champions a culture of life. Yes. And limits the extremes to say the Governor Newsom's in California and the others who are up to abortion on demand, up to birth, and have whoever pay for it at yeah. that time. We need to embrace a culture of life. Let me go to the next question, though, and this is the Heritage Foundation partnering with us. Something you know very well about is the ESGs. Yes. Uh, these are unelected people in the boardroom trying to force a very leftist agenda onto this country. As president, how do you counter that? Mm -hmm. That it's now the corporate boardroom, it's not the elected office holders. How do you champion, you know, listen, we're about making a profit. We're not about yes. forcing a liberal leftist agenda on this culture. So I'll say a few things. First is, I'm a big believer that not all solutions are delivered through the government. 
especially not through the federal government. So that's why in my most recent career journey before running for president, I founded a firm called Strive that's competing with BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard, offering alternative index funds and forms of investment that basically are the same kinds of investment vehicles offered by the pro-ESG firms. But now your money isn't used to vote to, for example, even fund Planned Parenthood. Actually, a lot of that comes from corporate funding. That's not somebody else's money. That's our retirement money invested in those corporations used to fund left-wing organizations like Planned Parenthood or emissions caps or racial equity audits and so on. So I believe in market solutions, but there's a big government role in this. So the Biden administration, this is just one of many such rules, right? The Biden administration last year changed the rules for how retirement funds are invested in this country. The old rule used to be that it has to be based on profit maximization. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm, I'm well, so allergic to this rule. It's hey, gonna, well, yeah, it's gonna, <laughs> I, can't even, I can't even get it out. It's such a bad rule for the Biden administration. It used to be profit maximization. Now, the rule that they changed it to at the Biden administration was to say that they can take into account, this is their words, not mine, in the rules, collateral benefits other than investment return. They didn't want to leave it to the imagination about which collateral benefits they're talking about. So they said, including, at the top of the list is climate change. That's a rule change. It's a big deal. So it's done through the Department of Labor. And just to give you a sense of how this administration works. So in June, they propose a draft rule change. They think this is going to be a big deal. So in the draft rule, it says that, okay, we're going to propose this rule change, but you have to disclose it to the retiree, to the person who's 401k plan or retirement accounts invested. You have to disclose it to them if you're using these other factors. By the time the final rule got passed in November, they dropped the disclosure requirement behind closed doors. Now, the Administrative Procedures Act says you have to do, you have to explain why you change a draft rule to the final rule. So they explained it. They said that the disclosure requirement would have a, again, their words, chilling effect on the use of ESG factors. That's a fancy way of saying if you tell people that you're using their money to advance social and political agendas, they would say, I don't want you to use my money to advance those social and political agendas. So it was purposefully hidden. In this case, the Democrats in the Senate had good sense to vote along with the Republican House to overturn that rule by statute. Biden's first veto was vetoing that legislation. So that still remains the new Biden rule, the law of the land. Mm. And that's how they're getting it done through the back door, Bob, is a bank would not have as good of an ESG score. I don't mean to make this land particularly at home, but I'm saying it to make a point to provide financing for an expansion plan for a new building or a new campus you might want to build for the family leader. And that's not unique to the family leader. It's if you're a coal company, if you're a company that's involved in drilling for oil, if you're a company that has refused to adopt a NASDAQ imposed diversity mandate on your board, that's how you get to Bud Light or to Target or to Coca-Cola behaving more like a super PAC than a soft drink manufacturer. It's invisibly using our own money to advance agendas that we would have never consented to with our own money. And though not, the government's not gonna be able to solve all of it, it requires market alternatives. And I've tried to do my part there. A big part of this is coming and being guided by the invisible hand of the federal government, not the market. So leadership does matter. Well, we say all the time, if you don't stand up now, you will be made to care. And yes. what they're doing is they are making you care. Family Policy Alliance is one of our partners too. They've been a huge proponent on boys compete against boys, girls yes. compete against girls, save girls sports, help not harm. The scripture talks about depraved mind. Mm -hmm. And when you always say, what's a depraved mind? And I think when you're trying to take a boy and change him into a girl, mm -hmm. trying to take a girl, change him into a boy, how do you lead on this you know, radicalism? Yes and even stripping parental rights away from this to embrace this type of ideology. What's your leadership in this type of environment? I think the first principle we have to embrace is actually one of compassion, actually. Hmm. And I think that compassion is grounded in truth. What is true? There are two genders. You have an XX chromosome, you're a girl. If you have an XY chromosome, you're a boy. And if you believe that your gender does not match your biological sex, that means you're suffering from a mental health condition. 
we don't and should not certainly look down on those who, or abandon those who suffer from mental health conditions. It is our responsibility, especially when it comes to young people, to help them. So the first question we should ask a kid when he says, oh, well, I think I'm a boy, but, but actually she's a girl, is what's going wrong? What else is going wrong at school? What's wrong at home? Get to the bottom of that, because that's a symptom. That's a kid crying out for help. And the compassionate thing to do is not to affirm that confusion. That is not compassion. That is cruelty. Mm. And we have to stand on the side of actual compassion. Kids aren't the same as adults. And so, and I know that I'm glad to see this has now worked its way into many of my fellow Republican contenders agreeing with me on this. This wasn't always the case, but I'm glad this is where we are as a party now, is that if you can't get a tattoo by the age of 18 to make a body-altering change to your body that you might later regret in life, as a kid, you should not be getting genital mutilation or chemical castration or puberty blockers, mm -hmm. what they call gender-affirming care before the age of 18 either. Kids aren't the same as adults, and we will stand for protecting children. Amen. And, thank you. Amen. And the, other, the, the only other point I would add there is we can't allow, freedom is one thing, oppression is another. And so as an adult, you're free to dress how you want, be how you want. I still believe in compassion and helping people who need help, but part of what it means to live in a free country is that sometimes you're free to make the wrong decision for yourself as long as you don't affect others. But you don't have a claim on changing our language, on changing what it means to compete in men's sports versus women's sports. You don't have a claim on deciding who isn't, is not is not labeled as a hate group for failing to adopt that orthodoxy. That's actually a form of oppression in the name of so-called fighting oppression that we have to hold the line and say that, okay, freedom means you can be you as an adult, but that's not what's going on in the country in the name of rights. Mm. We've actually created a new culture of oppression, and we have to stand for our own rights in actually preserving the actual version of truth that if you want a separate, if you want to swim in a pool, you're free to swim in a pool, but that doesn't mean you're free to get a trophy in a women's competition if you're a man. Mm. Stand for that as well. Well said, well said. And the foundation of all that is truth. If you take a look at the family leader, uh, think of three circles, uh, the church, the family, and government. Where those three intersect, that's where we play. Great. What would you say to people of faith? What should, there be, what should their role be to engaging this institution of government to honor God, to bless families, to love their neighbors themselves? But what is, what, what's the role of the people of faith to engage this institution of government? Be proactive. I think you, I think we have a responsibility that we should not shy away from. We were talking about this briefly before, and we actually talked about this the first time we met, Bob, is what I see in the country is a vacuum of purpose and meaning, especially among young people, but I think it's true of all people. I mean, tell me, I mean, I just think that we could talk about the thought experiment of the <clears throat> pregnant woman who was assaulted earlier. Let's try a different thought experiment here. Do you think that if we had more people who genuinely in their in their heart and in their bones believed in God today across the country. Do you think we would be as divided and polarized as we are? It's almost impossible to think that we would be, right? We're equal, our equality exists. We're equal in the eyes of each other because we're equal in the eyes of God. We would see one another as co-equal citizens because we know we are each made in the image of God. And yet, is it a coincidence that we see, at the same time we see a decline in faith, we see a decline in patriotism. The same time we see a decline in patriotism, we see a decline in self-confidence. The same time we see a decline in self-confidence, we have an epidemic of depression and anxiety and mental health illness, including gender dysphoria, including now latching on to struggles for civil rights that have long been achieved, wokeism, gender ideology, climate ideology. These are symptoms of a deeper vacuum of purpose and meaning in our country. Mm. And I think that the job of the next president, certainly I believe an important part of that job is to fill that void with a vision of American national identity. Answering, as I said at the beginning, what it means to be an American today that dilutes this poison to irrelevance. And that's an important part of the story, but I think the revival of God mm. and a belief in God, a belief that there's more to life than just this aimless passage of time, that actually there is something more meaningful, a purpose for which we're put here. I think that, I think that we're never going to get 100% of the way there, even with a revival of just national identity. 
I think that gets us back to a place of self-confidence so we can start talking openly about faith again. But to your question about what can institutions like yours or even the people in this room, people of faith, play is to not stand down and think that that's not your lane. To the contrary, we need people of faith to stand up without apology for what is true. And I think that the less we treat God as a three-letter word, or as a four-letter word, put it back to a three-letter word, I guess, but the, the, the better off we're going to be as a country in healing our national division. I've got one final question, but to, to us it would be bringing the timeless truth in a spirit of love to a wanting culture, a culture that needs that timeless truth, but bringing it in that compassionate voice with love for the individual and for the family in need. Last question. Uh, you talked about your upbringing. Yeah. First generation. Yeah. Your mom and dad came came here from India, right? They did, yep. And what, what does it say? I mean, do you ever stop, and if you're on your bus, on your way home on a plane or whatever, sitting at your home in Columbus, Ohio, do you ever think about, I'm running for president of the United States. What, what does that say to you? It what, says what goes through your DNA when, when, you, when you think about that? Gratitude to this country, actually. I mean, my parents came here for a reason. And yes, we grew up in Southwest Ohio in the mid-1990s when, you know, we were a little bit different than the other kids in the neighborhood we were growing up with. It wasn't a huge immigrant community exactly where we were. But it was a community that we became a part of, that we were welcomed into, my parents were welcomed into, and that gave us the foundation to go in a single generation to now not only living the American dream in an economic sense, but now at the age of 37, running for president of the United States, this is a country where that dream is still possible. Mm. And I feel like we're in this moment where we call it the American dream, it's interesting. You know, I feel like we're in this moment where we, we woke up from that dream. When you wake up from a dream, you can, you forget what it was about, but you still remember how it felt. That's where I feel like we are in our country right now, is we remember how it felt. I remember how it felt because I lived that dream. But pretty soon you forget how it felt too. And then I think the, the whole thing's gone mm -hmm. for the next generation. And so for me, now thinking about my parents' story and what they gave us, it kind of feels familiar again. Mm -hmm. Now we have two sons, my, I, I, yeah. my younger brother and I. We have two sons mm -hmm. who my wife and I have brought into this world and we're raising now in, in, in Columbus. And the question is, how can we actually create a country that passes on that dream to the next generation? If I had been born 20 years from when I was, I don't think that my story would have been possible. Not in the mm. same way. Maybe the monetary part would technically you know, still be possible. You could find examples of it. But I still would have been taught to think of myself as a victim. Taught to think of myself as somebody who was in some way oppressed. Why? Because that's the incentive structure that we've created. Is that, that's now how you get ahead. And so what I want to do is I, was, I, I want to create the culture that my parents in this country helped give to my brother and I to say that, yes, you're going to encounter some hardship, but hardship is not the same thing as victimhood. You're not defined by your hardships, or if you are, you can be defined in a good way by how you overcome them and pass that American dream to the next generation. And I think that that dream still exists. We just have to in a different sense of the word, actually wake up from our wokeness towards the American dream and actually start running to that vision of what it means to be an American again, that no matter who you are or where your parents came from or how long your last name is or what your skin <laughs> color is, that you actually still can achieve anything you want in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication, and that a big part of this is that you're also free to speak your mind at every step of the way. That's what it means to be American. That's what we're running to. And I think the more we're running to something, the more successful we're gonna be in actually getting there Amen. rather than just aimlessly running from something. Amen. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank your wife, Aporva, for putting yourselves on the line. Thank you. you could use your resources for a lot of things. You're using your resources to say, I wanna, I wanna make an impact in this country. Yeah. And you have an inspirational story, and I think a voice that needs to be heard in this process. Ladies and gentlemen, Vivek Ramaswamy. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.